This is the day the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. We worship him together in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. sound to me in tones so sweet and low. It was a simple little ditty in her good old Irish way. And I'd give the world if she could sing that song to me today. So would you all sing with us? Yes. 
It's really too bad you didn't fall further down in that <laughs> sense. <center. laughs> okay, now we're going to sing when Irish eyes are smiling. Y'all know it. So sing with us, please. We believe in God above us, maker and sustainer of all life, of sun and moon, of water and earth, and all that is. We believe A man of sorrows, he died forsaken. He descended into the earth to the place of death. On the third day, he rose from the tomb. He ascended into heaven to be everywhere present, and his kingdom will come on earth. Source of resurrection and eternal life. I cannot tell.
pray together. May the meaning of this hour of worship be fulfilled through the days and years to come. May the love of Christ and the unity of the Spirit grow deeper and stronger in the uncertainties and the changes of the life we share. May we find comfort together in this hour, cause us to rejoice, to be brave and generous, which make life beautiful and significant. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you. 
Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart, and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. We confess to you, O God, that we have not completely abandoned our pursuit of wealth. 
We want to be your disciples, but the lure of goods has tempted us. Although by the world's standards we are wealthy beyond belief, we think we do not have enough of the material things of life. Forgive us our fascination with the things and call us months more to the simple life of being satisfied with our life in you and in the joy of sharing. Amen. God offers you once again the opportunity to let go of material things, take hold of the true treasures of life. God offers you life, peace, and joy that is not dependent on what you own. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and called to follow the poor carpenter of Nazareth. Sweet hour of prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, good and gracious and loving God, we come before you in this hour of worship, understanding anew that you fill us with joy, you fill us and enfold us with love. You care about us like no one else ever has or could. And we are grateful. A God who provides and loves and cares, who forgives and who restores. A God who seemingly cannot do enough for his children. And that you would send us your son that he would come to us and like his father would lavish upon us such love, such care, would provide us with such an example of generosity and justice. We certainly don't deserve any of what you have given. And today we approach your throne of grace to acknowledge before you once again our great need of your spirit, our great need of you to fill our very being with a sense of your presence in all things and at all times. We pray, Heavenly Father, now before you for those that are on our hearts who are going through tough times. We pray for those who have lost loved ones. We pray for those who are sick in the hospital and recovering from surgeries. Particularly, we pray for Karen Rousseau, that you'd be with her. 
We pray for those who are at home with family and friends, with hospice. We pray especially today for Henry, that you'd be with her. We pray for those who are week in and wake out dealing with cancers, infusions, and treatments, and medications, and all the things that come to us, especially later in life. Make us strong, make us patient, but most of all, let us put our hand in yours and not let go. We pray today for those that are on our hearts who need a special touch from you. We mentioned their first names before this year, Throne of Grace, and we believe with all of our heart that as their name leaves our lips, it enters your ear and heart, and amazing miracles can begin to happen. Hear us, Father, as we carry to you in our prayers those who hurt and those who need a healing, and those who need to be encouraged. Hear us as we mention them now. We believe, we know, we have experienced that there is nothing that you cannot do. You are the God who created everything. You are the God who breathed life into this clay that is our body. You are the one who walks beside us, puts your arm around us, and loves us through the tough times. You are the one who sent your son, who would die on a cross, and yet burst forth from a tomb and live forevermore, to send his power, his glory, his wonder, to live within each of us, and later to call us home to himself. For all of this convinces us that the miracles we ask for, that the things that we need and desire have already begun to happen. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, the Christ, who taught us to say when we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This time we'll call upon the ushers to receive our morning tithes and offerings. There is no spot in Ireland as beautiful and as Irish as Galway. And though it faces the turbulent North Atlantic, its waters are gentled by the Isle of Arran. Even in our modern time, its beaches are clear and shiny. Its meadows are emerald green and its air perfumed by the heather. Since it, this song was written in 1926, it has taken its place alongside Danny Boy as a rallying cry for Irishmen everywhere as a hymn to home. If you ever go across the sea to Ireland, then maybe at the closing of the day, you will sit and watch the moon rise over Clada and see the sun go down on Galway Bay. Just to hear again the ripple of the trout stream, the women in the meadows making hay. And to sit beside the turf fire in the cabin and watch the barefoot gossens at their play. For the breeze is blowing o'er the sea from Ireland, are perfumed by the heather as they blow. And the woman in the uplands digging pratties 
speak a language that the strangers do not know. For the strangers came and tried to teach us their way. They scorned us just for being what we are. But they might as well be chasing after moonbeams. Or light a penny candle from the star. And if there's gonna be a life hereafter, and somehow I'm sure there's gonna be, I will ask my God to let me make my heaven in that dear land across the Irish Sea. In that dear land across the Irish Sea. Gracious Heavenly Father, we have been so blessed to live in this place of abundance. Walk with you and be provided for, be loved every step along the path of life. And now to your throne of grace, we come to say thank you. We bring you these, our gifts, and we ask that you would bless them and use them along with each of us to carry forth the cause and the work of your son, that his love, his mercy, his healing might be used throughout this world, this community, and this church. For it is in his name we pray. Amen. Good morning. morning. Our reading this morning comes from Ruth, chapter 1, verses 8 through 18. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they wept aloud and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons? who could become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I'm too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It's more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord's hand has turned against me. 
At this, they wept aloud. Again then, Obed kissed her mother-in-law goodbye. But Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods, so go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. And your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. And there, I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped her urging. Here ends a reading of our Holy Scriptures this morning. Jim asked that we sing a couple of Irish tunes, obviously, and so here it is, O oh Danny Boy. O oh Danny Boy, the pipes, the pipes are calling from glen to glen. And down the mountain side, the summer's gone, and all the flowers are dying. Tis you, tis you must go, and I must bide. But come ye back when summer's in the meadow or when the valley's hushed and white with snow and i'll be here in sunshine or in shadow oh danny boy oh danny boy I love you so. And when ye come, when all the flowers are dying, and I am dead, is dead I well may be. I pray you'll find the place where I am lying and kneel and say and Ave there for me. And I shall hear the soft you tread above me and all my dreams will warm and sweeter be if you'll not fail to tell me that you love me and i shall sleep in peace until you come to me and i shall sleep in peace until you come to me Thank you, Melanie, and thank you, Jim. We have um, 
two prayer shawls to dedicate this morning. And um, if you're visiting with us or you're not aware of, we, we have these Afghan type prayer shawls that are made by our ladies. And uh, we give these out to people who are going through tough times. And the response to this has just been amazing. I mean, it's just been such a blessing to people for the love and the prayers that uh, these represent and the gift that it is to them. So we, we are grateful to be able to do this. Uh, this first one goes to, uh, I'm gonna mess this up, I know. Corinne Adratus, did I say it right? Ah, my Greek is there. Adratus, and she has a broken ankle and also uh, broke a hip also, and is also on dialysis. <laughs> what, a, what a poor lady. So we're going to do this for Corinne and also uh, one for Karen Rose. Karen has uh, been one of our financial secretaries and worked hard for us. And she uh, is currently up in the hospital in Ocala. She had surgery on Monday and uh, we thought this was going to be an in and out in a day or so. And it uh, turns out that there were some complications and some infection and she's still there. And uh, so we need to send this along to her as well. So could I have a couple people come up for me, please? Together. Gracious Heavenly Father, we bring before you these two Afghans, these two prayer shawls, which have been made by the work of loving hands. And we ask that through your spirit, we might dedicate these to those who really hurt and really need them. To Karen and to Corinne, we ask that uh, these might represent to them the love and the prayers and the concern of all of us. We know there's no magic in them. There's no special cloth or anything that is beyond the, the realm of just common everyday knitting and material. But there is something very special anyway. It is our, our love, it is our care, it is our prayers. And so we ask that these might go to them and they might envelop them and they might fill them with a sense of caring and love. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you have that video, Billy? You don't? No? All right, never mind. We'll do it. We're running, we're running late anyway. <clears throat> Some of you, uh, if you've been here the last couple of weeks, you know that we have been doing kind of like a little introit before the message. And this uh, is written by Max Licato. It's become sort of our, our prelude into the, uh, the time of uh, sharing in our message. So I ask you to join me in, in saying it together. I am building my life on the promises of God because his word is unbreakable. My hope is unshakable. I do not stand on the problems of life or the pain of life. I stand on the great and precious promises of God. Say that again with me. I stand on the great and precious promises of God. Thank you. May the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O God. Well, this is St. Patrick's Day. It's a day when we all wear green. It's a day when we uh, celebrate uh, being Irish, even if we're not. So I'd like to tell you an Irish love story today. It's not just an Irish love story, it's a worldwide love story, but we're gonna approach it from the Emerald Isle. We're going to talk about it with some illustrations of love from, from Ireland itself. I'd like to take you first of all to Kylemore Abbey. Uh, I've been to this place twice and, and I, I wanna go back so desperately. It's just one of the most beautiful spots on earth. It's near Galway. You heard the Galway song a little earlier, and this is, this is very close to Galway. To get there, you have to wind down those roads that you saw in some of the pictures that 
are not really two lanes wide, they're one lane wide, and there's stone walls alongside them, and there's sheep standing in the middle of them, and you haven't lived until you've ridden in a little van down those roads, winding roads, with Gail Wigner at the wheel. <laughs> Never have I prayed so hard for so long. So, yeah, the first time we were there and went to Kyle Moore Abbey, uh, we, we wound through those. And we, we had to stop every now and then to let the sheep go across the road. So it's, it, is what, it is what the pictures and what the, uh, what the uh, tourist people tell you it is. It's just amazing. But Kyle Moore Abbey is a beautiful, beautiful place. And it's even beautiful in the wintertime. Uh, and you don't get a lot of snow in Ireland, but uh, I, I, and I didn't get to see this, but this picture, I actually bought a picture of this in the gift shop. I have it in my home. And it's just uh, like a, a fairy tale castle, isn't it? It's just beautiful. And Kyle Moore Abbey was built by Mitchell and uh, Margaret Henry in 1868. It was originally their little castle uh, with lots of rooms and lots of bathrooms and uh, lots of parties going on. Uh, Unfortunately, about seven years after it was finished in 1875, uh, the Henrys were on vacation down in Cairo, Egypt, and Margaret uh, took the fever. She got some kind of, uh, I don't know if she got uh, bitten by a bug or whatever, but she got very, very sick, and she died there in Cairo. And so they embalmed her body and shipped her back to Ireland and uh, she was she lied and she lay in state in at Calmore Abbey for a while. I was just Calmore House then, and uh, uh, eventually she was she was buried on the on the property. In her honor, they, these this couple was so loving. They had nine children. She died when she was only forty five years old. But there was such a love affair between these two people, and so such a closeness uh, that he never really did, although he lived about 30 more years. He never got over Margaret, and uh, uh, the two of them are buried side by side on, on the property near this beautiful little Gothic chapel that he built in her honor. It is just uh, glorious. It's not huge, but it is, it is a, uh, just a beautiful Gothic church, and uh, this is, in comparison to that church he built to her and in her honor, this is the tomb, this is the mausoleum that he built uh, in the woods uh, along the trail between Calmore House and, and, the, and the church uh, for her to be interred and, and where he is now interred as well. So the two of them are, are there forever. They were good Christian people who had all that, that simple faith and uh, they perpetuated it for many, many people who go there, who still worship there. At one time it was a... a it was a nunnery, and it was uh, used for uh, worship services for the Catholic Church. And now it's it's basically a, an open to the public. They have uh, evangelistic meetings there. They have uh, uh, chapel services. They have uh, concerts and all kinds of things in this chapel. But it stands as a a uh, symbol, as a as a, a, a monument to the love of these two people who, uh, for nearly two, more than two, almost two centuries now. Uh, loved one another and cared for one another, and it's a great Irish love story. This is the, the beautiful gardens that surround Kyle Moore Abbey. It's just an amazing place, an amazing place. The best, the best part of it is to stand across the lake when you first get there and, and look at that, that amazing castle uh, that was built by these two lovebirds and to, to realize the story and the shortness of life and the value of life and how when, when you have love, you, you hang on to it with everything that you can. Well, not only is Calmore uh, Abbey close to uh, Galway, uh, it's also close to the home of the Cladaw Ring. And uh, I don't know how many, how many have heard of Cladaw Rings? Uh, pretty many of you, good. Uh, the Cladaw Ring is two hands and a heart and a, and a crown. And uh, there's symbolism to how it's worn. If it's worn on the right hand, uh, with the uh, with the crown facing away from you, uh, that means that you are open to friendship, relationship, what have you, uh, and and people will see that and know that they can approach you and and befriend you or ask you out on a date or whatever. The other way is on your right hand as you turn it around and have the uh, crown facing toward you. 
and that means that you're not interested. Okay, and when you wear it on on this hand, and I happen to have mine on with my wedding ring, if you wear it on this hand and the crown is facing away from you, that means that you're not married, but you're certainly in the market. And if you wear it with the crown facing toward you, like I have, uh, that means that you are married uh, and you're not in the market. And, or if you're a lady wearing it, it probably means that you are married and your husband has a gun. No. <laughs> so anyway, but the, that's the Cladaw ring, and it's a symbol of uh, of love and caring. This is this is again Galway Bay, and you see the little red uh, building in the middle of the screen. Uh, that is. Uh, part of the colorful Cladaw neighborhood or the Cladaw community, which is part of or next door or attached to Galway. And uh, this, is, this is the uh, uh, actual jeweler who since for, for the last 200 plus years has pro been producing the Cladaw ring, the Dylan, Thomas Dylan and Son uh, jewelers with the Cladaw ring. And Cladaw is how it's pronounced, but if you do it in Gala Gaelic, it's Cladaw. <laughs> So they, they kind of spit everything in Gaelic. So Thomas. So there, there's uh, the beautiful Cladaw ring, and uh, there's, the, there's the symbols that represents, and this is what it means. The two hands represent friendship. The heart symbolizes love, and the crown on top of that heart is for loyalty. And those are the symbol, the three symbols that are in the ring, and it's a sign of a love. It's, it's popular all over the world, and it all comes from that little area of Ireland uh, where it was developed and marketed and now goes around the world. So from that side of Ireland, I'm going to take you all the way across the island to Dublin. And when we get to Dublin, we're going to talk about a different saint. You know, there's two popular saints in America that even Protestants uh, buy the greeting cards for. Uh, that's Saint... Patrick on St. Patrick's Day, and prior to that, of course, we talked about St. Valentine. And uh, some of the relics, and what relics are is bones or, or things that were possessions of or whatever that the Catholic Church uh, worships over and deifies and so on, which is nonsense, but that's what they do. Uh, they, took those, they take those relics and they actually become a, a, a fundraising tool and a, and a thing to attract people. Well, some of the bones, supposedly, of St. Valentine are in Dublin. And they are there in the, uh, you see the sign there, they're there in the White Friar Church. And this is the White Friar Church in Dublin. And this is the entrance to the, to the church. And this is the statue of St. Valentine. And uh, underneath the altar, supposedly, are some of the bones of St. Valentine. Now, to be honest with you, I've told you before about the difference with with legends and history, and there is a difference. It doesn't mean we can't learn from legends. It doesn't mean we, we need to sit back and start picking away at everybody's beliefs or picking away at, at history and, and disputing this and that to the place where nothing has any value anymore. Uh, so there, there is some truth to all the legends, and we can concentrate on the truths and not on the things we don't agree with. Uh, negativity gets us nowhere. So uh, this is supposedly where some of the bones of St. Valentine are. Now, to be honest with you, again, I can tell you there are places in Europe, there are places in England, there's these places in Ireland that all claim to have some of the bones of St. Valentine. And if you added up all the bone parts that are in all of those places, St. Valentine would be a mighty army, let me tell you. There's, you know, a lot of a lot of St. Valentine bones, and that's, that's, the, that's the order. So we have St. Patrick, and we have St. Valentine, and we get a, a little picture of the love and the emotion and the, the generosity and the, the warmth of, of the Irish people and the beauty of this place. It's, it's just an amazing thing. So when we get together, we, we celebrate all of that, and it's kind of fun. And uh, you know, might say, well, what, is that, what does all that have to do with, with faith and with, with church and with uh, uh, belief? Uh, I think it has a lot to do with it because it is it is my faith that lets me see the beauty. It is my faith that lets me cut through the negativity to see 
the wonder and the joy and the amazing creativity of my heavenly father. Uh, it is that, that, that faith that I have in Jesus on that horrible scene on the cross that lets me go through the horror to the fact that I am loved that much, that someone would die for me, that someone would uh, care for me enough that I might be set free. So uh, all of life has value. And when you lose your, your respect or your love for a part of life, you lose a little bit of respect and love for all of life. And our culture would do well to remember that. This is St. Patrick, or at least a stained glass window artist's view of St. Patrick. And you notice what he's holding in his hand? A shamrock. And what did he use the shamrock to teach? The Trinity. Good, you've got it. Yes, he used it. The, the three leaves represented the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Tradition says nobody, nobody was there, or at least I don't think anybody. Well, there's one lady in the back row that was there. Uh, Nobody was there to hear that, so we'll just go with legend that St. Patrick actually used the shamrock. Also, another legend about St. Patrick was that he drove all the snakes out of Ireland. Well, we're pretty sure that there weren't any snakes there to begin with, so I don't know what snakes he drove out of Ireland. This was written by St. Patrick. We do actually have from uh, some written documentation, St. Patrick wrote something called his Confessions, uh, we think he was being tried for something, and no one knows for sure what it was, but he wrote this uh, several pages of uh, a testimonial of his faith and his life and so forth. And so we get a, a, some real poignant and real powerful quotes that are attributed to St. Patrick from that St. Patrick's Confessions thing. So uh, he said, may the wisdom of God instruct us, may the hand of God protect us, may the word of God direct us. Now, when you go to that, you begin to hear with your, with your mind and your heart, you begin to hear those Irish blessings, don't you? you know, may the road rise up to meet you. May the wind be always at your back. Well, this is, this is kind of the, the limerick or the kind of uh, cadence of the verse that uh, goes all the way back to St. Patrick. Wisdom of God instruct us, hand of God protect us, word of God direct us. And this is a quote from St. Patrick, and these, this, he actually wrote this, and uh, Historians are pretty sure this is accurate. The uh, Lord has rescued me from so many dangers that sometimes I just have to ask, God, who am I? What is it that you want me to do? When St. Patrick was about 15 or 16 years old, his confession says, and the story goes, that he was abducted in England and he was taken to Ireland by pirates. or That's what they called them anyway. And there he was sold off as a slave. And he, he served as a slave for about five or six years, tending animals, according to the confessions, and uh, caring for them and, and slopping the pigs and so forth. And then he escaped, went down to the wharf and talked the captain, a sea captain, into taking him back to England. And he finally worked his way back to his family and and later became ordained a priest and, and got involved in the church. But he, he talks in his confessions about the sacrifice and the tough time that he had. And that's what he's referring to. The Lord has rescued me from so many dangers that sometimes I just have to ask, God, who am I? What is it that you want me to do? You've worked beside me, helped me with, my, with your divine power so that now I can praise and glorify your name constantly among non-believers wherever I might be in bad times or in good. He is, he is a slave. He goes away. And then he makes a decision. He believes he's heard the voice of God sending him back to Ireland again. Can you imagine that? You're captured by pirates. You go to Ireland. And, you know, he didn't land in, an, in, in a, a jet plane at Dublin International and grab a bite to eat at, uh, at Dunkin' Donuts on his way to the cab to go to the hotel. He was drugged to this scurvy-looking wharf, drug inland, put on a cart, taken and sold off to somebody out on some rudimentary-looking farm, uh, no, no John Deere on property, and, and slop pigs for six years. It was awful. It was awful. And these people were not Christians. These people were not believers. They were tribal people. Uh, all of Ireland was populated by little 
clans and enclaves, little tribes of people with chieftains and warlords and so forth. And it's into this awful, violent Irish culture uh, that, that he was taken and that he lived for six years as an impressionable teenage boy and, and in his early 20s at the, at the oldest. So this was, this was what he believes God's power was there beside him through all of that and that it kept him and that he, he uh, glorified God and, and came to faith in the midst of that time. Uh, bad times and good. Whatever happens to me, good or evil, I must accept it and give thanks to God. He has taught me to trust in him without any limits. So you can, when you read this and you then hear the history and you know what he went through, you know, the toughness of tough times in life, uh, it's, it's an amazing story uh, that he held on, that he came to faith, that he went back and that he dedicated his life to God and then went back to Ireland, to those people and to that awful place and, and to that terrible memory that he had in order to bring those people to Jesus Christ. It's St. Patrick's story, and it's, a, it's an amazing story of faith and dedication and commitment and uh, serving God rather than self. So that's part of St. Patrick's story. So I, I put together a couple of things that we can learn from St. Patrick because of that story. And one is to overcome your past with confidence. I mean, this is a guy who had to overcome awful memories and awfully, an awful experience in life in order to, uh, to go back there and to do what he believed God was calling him to do. He believed God's voice had spoken to him and that he was supposed to go take Jesus Christ and the gospel to, to these people in Ireland. Awful place at the time. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13, forgetting what lies behind, straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on. And that has got to be the feel in the heart of St. Patrick when he gets on that boat, not because he's forced on it by pirates, but because he chooses to get on it and just to serve God and to honor God and to go back to Ireland uh, and to communicate. And it wasn't easy when he got there either. <laughs> they were not there. Oh, good, an evangelist. We're going to have a Billy Graham crusade here in what, what will become Dublin one day. Um, it was it was bad. He was one on one communicating, and he would have first have to communicate and and bring the the chieftain or the warlord to Jesus, uh, and then he could work from there to get the people. Isaiah the prophet said, "Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old." This was the heart of Saint Patrick as he put behind him the negativity and the hurts and the bad things, and choose in spite of chose in spite of that to serve God and to be a testimony for him. Be obedient to God. Number two, be obedient to God when it seems to make no sense to you. You know, sometimes it just doesn't make any sense to do what God is calling you to do in the natural. And it would not have made in the natural any sense for Patrick once he'd finally escaped the pig slop and gotten back to England to turn around. And uh, that, well, there was some time elapsed. He went uh, to back to England, got back to his family, spent a little time in Europe, became uh, ordained and trained, and then he, then he decides to make this decision. Instead of taking a nice, comfortable church somewhere and, uh, and having his career as a priest, he decides to become a missionary and go back to Ireland and back to this, and that just doesn't make any sense. You know, if you were St. Patrick and you had that kind of memory in your heart and you were now back in, in England trained and you could have a church and you could have a, a life and some comforts and so forth, and God said to you, uh, listen, uh, Patrick, I'd like you to go back to Ireland with the, where you were slopping the pigs and where the people were awful to you and where they treated you badly and abused you, where they don't want to hear any of this Jesus stuff. I'd like you to go back there now. Yeah, right. Sometimes we have to be, be obedient to God when it makes no sense to us. And that's something we learn from St. Patrick. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. In other words, you listen to God even when it doesn't make sense to you because you just don't always get it. 
you are not always capable of discerning and understanding and, and making the right decisions. So we listen to God even when it makes no sense. Number three, and finally, don't be afraid to get dirty serving God or loving his people. Remember, these are the memories Patrick has. Patrick's now gotten cleaned up. He's now wearing the uh, priestly robes and the whole bit. He's now, you know, the ladies are probably bringing casseroles, even though he's a priest and he can't get married. And uh, he's, he's probably got his Kladar ring on with like, get away from me. And, uh, but he decides he's going to go back and he's going to wallow with the heathen. He's going to go back where he's mistreated. He's going to go back where he knows they're not very receptive to Jesus and the gospel. They don't even want to hear this stuff. And, and the chieftains and the warlords are even threatened by it. So he's got to go back and get dirty. He's got to go back and, and love people who won't necessarily love him. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble and keep on praying. In spite of all the, the negative stuff we have to get into, we keep the faith. There's also a, a, a document which supposedly comes from the breastplate of the armor of St. Patrick. And it's got some things that have been recorded and brought down in history, some of which are valid, some of which may not be. But this is where we get this phraseology, and you probably have heard this before. Christ beside me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ within me, Christ beneath me, Christ above me. In other words, I am enveloped with Christ. I am protected by Jesus. I am, I am uh, in this protective bubble or cocoon that is the, the spirit of the living Christ. And that, that was on his breastplate. That was his protection. Jesus was his protection. Also on that breastplate, it said, I bind unto myself today the power of God to hold and lean. In other words, he is fastening to himself. He is taking within himself. He is making a part of himself the power of God. Uh, and that power of God, he wants to hold and use to lead him. Um, finally, I said a moment ago about the Irish blessings. You know, we've gone from Galway, and we've seen uh, the wonderful story of Kyle Morabi and, and the love of, the, of Mitchell and Margaret, and we've, uh, we've seen the Cladaw Ring and, uh, and, and the love that it represents in relationships, and we've heard about uh, uh, the saint of love, St. Valentine, is, is buried there. Uh, such great history, uh, such amazing history. This, my tie, somebody said to me, how come you don't have a green tie on? Well, it has green in it. But this, this is actually uh, some of the lettering from the Book of Kells, uh, which is at uh, Trinity College in Dublin. And it was written, it's, it's the Gospels that was put together with calligraphy. And it's one of the great Irish treasures, uh, this book. And we went to see it. And it is, uh, it was written in, in 1800. I mean, excuse me, in 800. Uh, so it's, it's got a lot of history to it, but that's, that's why I wore that. And, and you'll notice that the green in the tie goes with the green in the suit. So it doesn't, it doesn't match the, the green in Mike Kunz's underwear, but that's all right. Uh, <clears throat> so there's a lot of, a lot of history uh, and a lot of gospel history and uh, a lot of overcomer history in, in the Irish people. And the Irish blessings... Uh, May there always be these, you know, may there always, may this, may that, you know, it's a, it's a blessing, it's a pointing ahead, it's a, it's a positive thing. May there always be work for your hands to do. May your purse always hold a coin or two. Unless you're coming to church, then you want to leave those coins at home because they're going to, they're going to try to sell you something. Right? Um, may the sun always shine upon your window pane. May a rainbow be certain to follow each rain. May the hand of a friend always be near to you, and may God fill your heart with gladness to cheer you. I'm not deifying Ireland. Ireland is just a place. But what happens there and the beauty and the grace of its people and the stories and the history and the love stories and the, the, the joy and love of story 
that's there and and the understanding of of god putting within each of us the ability to laugh and find joy even in the most crazy of things uh is is there and so ireland is is worthy of looking at once a year and uh, it is worthy of of our uh, understanding that god blesses all his people the irish and the italians and the the whole world he's got the whole world in his hands heavenly father we thank you for the example of patrick and valentine and all those who have served you whether in ireland or around the world we thank you for the joy which comes even in the midst of hard work and tough times we thank you for history and the lessons that it teaches us we ask you to help us to learn from that history make us strong make us loving make us appreciate each and every day let us look out on the hillsides and on the colors around us and the sky above us and know that there is a god in heaven there is a loving heavenly father who has made all things good and who is good all the time for it is in your name we pray amen Um, I'm not sure. One. We're going to sing just one verse of Be Thou My Vision. The presence of God surrounds you, the love of God enfolds you, the power of God protects you. Wherever you are, wherever you go, whatever you do, there God is. Thanks so much for coming.